highly consequential negotiations eventually become highly nuanced. And being able to thread those needles is really important. Under what conditions do we bargain with war criminals or those who are accused of war crimes? All nuclear negotiations, I would argue, are coercive. Not all coercive negotiations are nuclear. Sanctions take the time to work. The armed conflict location and event data project, for instance, the ACLED, reported last February of 2022 that Ethiopia, Yemen, the Sahel, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Sudan, Haiti, Colombia, and Myanmar would be the 10 conflicts to watch this year, while the International Crisis Group went further to point Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, Afghanistan, Iran, versus the US and Israel, Ethiopia, Yemen, Islamist militants in Africa and Ethiopia as the most concerning 10 conflicts to watch in 2022. But the Center for Preventive Action under the Council on Foreign Affairs provided another set of survey results, which includes Afghanistan, Haiti, Lebanon, Venezuela, China toward Taiwan, Iran and Israel, Mexico, uh, North Korea, Ukraine and Russia, and added cyber attack on U.S. critical infrastructure state. A common fact, despite any discrepancy in the countries to include or not, due to the typology of each conflict, I'm privileged to discuss with Eugene Kogan, a professor who has been following closely most of them and has been not only teaching conflict resolution at Harvard, Brandeis, and other universities, is also co-author of the book Mediation, Negotiation by Other Moves. In addition, he has also been engaged in delivering an analytical message and strategies across in a contribution for sustainable negotiation processes. Welcome to Thinking Through with LJ, Professor. To start us off, in the context of ongoing conflicts, help me understand what coercive and nuclear negotiation is. So, Leo, I I appreciate this question. And and, and the reason is that, you know, I want to take a step back before we delve into what coercive negotiation, as I call it, is. I want to say a couple of words about the pedagogy because we are all students at the end of the day and how we have been approaching to studying negotiation. And I'm sure to the listeners of your podcast, Mm -hmm. the book getting to yes will not be a new title that I am announcing, right, which came out in 1981 and has been in many ways the Bible of negotiation, teaching, and learning. The interests-based negotiation, what I call the Harvard approach to negotiation, which is based on the idea of understanding the interests of the other side and trying to find the mutually beneficial solutions as a result of the negotiation process, the win-win style of negotiation. And yet, and this is something that uh, I have been focusing on all of my professional career, a lot of negotiation does not proceed uh, on on the win-win model. And uh, there, you know, the great Howard Rafa, the, 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 the doyen of negotiation, teaching and learning at Harvard Law School has pointed out that some actors in the negotiation space are rule manipulators, that they will, in fact, even during a win-win negotiation, try to, to, to t- twist the rules into their advantage and to be hard bargaining. Right. And this hard bargaining has been the issue that has concerned me for a long time. And yet in most of the in a lot of the negotiation teaching, we do not pay enough attention to these, you know, hard bargaining tactics. And that's what really has been my uh, my my effort uh, to understand how actors use power to Mm. turn the negotiation uh, table and to turn negotiation process into their to their advantage. And so, for example, at the, uh, the Harvard Negotiation Journal um, in 2019 sponsored a special issue on how Donald Trump negotiates. And um, I was, pr- was privileged to be asked to contribute an article about 
how that kind of style of power bargaining takes place. We won't take the conversation today into that mm. into that area, but just gives you a sense of the types of things that I have been been researching. And these insights are critical to understanding how today, as we look at the conflict today between Russia and Ukraine, how to think about the bargaining that has to take place to end the war, to bring this horrific human uh, and societal suffering to an end. These negotiations will be coercive negotiations. And that's what I talk about in the article that I've mm. written, et cetera. Of course, Lincoln to Dongon conflicts uh, almost everywhere, but with, with a focus, one that you have been directly involved in, in studying the, the Russia, Ukraine, uh, what coercive and nuclear negotiation really means? The use of coercion uh, has been studied obviously a lot in international affairs, uh, and it involves limited use of power. If I'm if I'm just going to limit myself for a moment to introduce the subject to the to how coercion is understood in in international uh, affairs, limited uh, targeted use of power to persuade your opponent, and this is where talking in the international relations space, to change their behavior. And as I apply it to the negotiation, to the teaching of negotiation, to understanding what coercive negotiation is, I define coercive negotiation as use of power to shape the perceptions of your counterpart, of what the counterpart's options really are. Because in negotiation, we all have options, right? In the win-win negotiation, in the Harvard method, all of the listeners to your podcast will probably recognize the acronym BATNA, right? The best mm -hmm. alternative to a negotiated agreement. Something that we have come of age learning about, right? What's your BATNA? We always ask each other as it has we become a name of its own. It's become it's become a brand of its own, a name of its own. Well, understanding how your interlocutor and how you yourself see your BATNA is the purpose of a coercive negotiation approach to shape the perception of how attractive is your BATNA, to be able to increase potentially the costs of going to your BATNA, and perhaps alternatively choosing a different approach, right? So, um, uh, for example, in a if if you apply this to let's say a coercive negotiation over Russia and Ukraine, as a um, as an analytical matter, as a negotiate as a matter of negotiation analysis, when you think about the choices that, let's say. Um, of Vladimir Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, has in these negotiations. You think about the choice of reaching a some kind of a compromise solution with uh, the Russian Federation, or you think about the choice of um, continuing to fight uh, the Russian the, the the Russian troops that are invading his country. And you try to do this analysis of what kinds of values are attached to each and what kinds of actions by the Russian side and, by the way, by the NATO alliance, including the United States and the Western powers, can influence President Zelensky's thinking, perceptions of how attractive those options are. This reminds me of your article, the one that you recently published in the Newsweek media outlet. And um, when discussing, of course, the, the negotiations, specifically the Russian and Ukraine conflict, and your headline there says, without giving in, a united West needs to offer Putin a face-saving way out. What do you mean by that? So one of the things we have to remember very starkly about this, this war is that one of the parties... Uh, the invading party, the Russian Federation, is a nuclear power. And this is mm. something that we have to put starkly on the table 
as a beginning of the as a beginning of the discussion. Uh, and Russia, including President Putin himself, have been very clear in at least raising the possibility that nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, could be part of the means they would employ in this in this conflict. Those statements simply, in my opinion, cannot be ignored. We have to be vigilant and uh, and careful. And so the argument that I make in this uh, in this uh, article is that a united West, by which I mean Ukraine, together in consultation with its Western uh, with its Western partners, need to think very carefully about how to, on the one hand, prevent obviously prevent Russia from winning. But at the same time, avoid creating a situation where Russia and in particular, personally, President Putin is humiliated. This is um, where I would, I would want to link to all this backstage events going on. And we are now very exposed to the media following a few diplomatic, uh, diplomatic engagements and some of them coordinated, but most of which very independent sanctions come come again. And and I remember Colin Walsh at Harvard Gazette, he references you and Professor Alan saying uh, there is a need to find a back channel. And w- what do you make of it? Just to give it more uh, content. So so let me let me I, I will I will come to your question about the the back channel in a moment. Let me just let me just make something mm-hmm. something. And this is a a nuanced argument that I'm trying to make, but I think that most highly consequential negotiations eventually become highly nuanced. And uh, 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 being able to thread those needles is really important. Um, I want to be clear about something. In this conflict between Russia and Ukraine, we must prevent Russia from succeeding. But we must avoid creating a situation where President Putin is humiliated. Mm, why is that? In any negotiation, I would argue you need to avoid mortifying your opponent or your interlocutor. Any negotiation that uh, uh, leaves the other side feeling that they have been uh, completely uh, destroyed and 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 completely humiliated might lead to some dangerous consequences. And in this case, where you're dealing with a leader of a of a nuclear power, uh, and while I won't go into great detail in this, but the, from what I understand about the psychology of President Putin as an individual. This is a kind of person who will not allow himself to be uh, uh, publicly uh, mortified. And when this individual is a leader of a nuclear power, this creates some constraints as to how we lead these negotiations. And so it is important in the in the language of the win-win Harvard method to write for the, your opponent the victory speech. Right mm. to be able to for them to claim, as I say in the article, and this is again a kind of a nuanced um, point that 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 is that is in 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 this polarized environment and obviously highly emotionally charged environment is hard to make. It is important, and again, I take a step back when you are dealing with a, somebody who is accused of. Uh, committing war crimes, especially in view of what has emerged in recent days from from Buka in in Ukraine, this is becomes a very difficult argument to make. But to allow that person, that interlocutor, to claim a small but tangible win that they can bring back to their domestic audience, and to allow them to back out without escalating even further. 
because this potential for escalation constantly exists and we have to – and that escalation when you're dealing with Russia might become nuclear. And that, that those are the lessons really, Leo, that I bring out of the – as I've mentioned, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis research that I am doing. There are strong parallels there where in that situation where President Kennedy was facing what was a – existential threat to U.S. homeland with nuclear missiles would be, po- would be pointed against the United States, he still managed to have enough um, restraint and wisdom to allow his interlocutor, in that case, his opponent, Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, allow him a, a decent ramp off, uh, a decent way, way out. As I say, the more we learn about the behavior of the Russian army in Ukraine, the more difficult it becomes to even think in those in those terms. And that's where we have to consider the alternative, that if there's no ramp off and if they, we give in to our impulse that we need to just defeat the adversary in an all-out uh, war – that the consequences for the possibilities for escalation of miscalculation might be might be significant. And are those risks, I ask your audience and I ask ourselves, are those risks we are willing to take? Well, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a deep question there because um, I'm trying. I was tempted as you you spoke that. The idea of giving the opponent a way out, and I remembered well what happened to Gaddafi, and did he have have a way out in in, in this in the whole process? And, and others, of course, it's it's a kind of a conflicting scenario because we have people in in one hand who advocate for a radical uh, shift, and 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 now we 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 know about the war crime accusations, and and that. Legal speaking activates a whole set of different mechanisms. So, what what would that play um, into the ongoing negotiations? So, look, uh, it's it's well known that uh, Gaddafi, the video of the uh, a brutal murder of Gaddafi, President Putin watched that video um, multiple times in a row apparently that's what i hear from the media that i that i from the russian speaking uh, sources that i that i watch and i should have said at the beginning i was i was born in moscow um and uh immigrated to the united states as a teenager uh over over 25 years ago so i have a personal i'm a native russian speaker i have a personal attachment and and personal perspective obviously uh on this issue um, so I'm not an attorney, so I should be careful. I'm not an international law expert, and and the, the law surrounding the regulation surrounding negotiations with those accused of war crimes and whether these things are documented and formally formally established. But I think that the let me just say that I think that the issue presents some deep both practical negotiation challenges but also obviously moral and ethical challenges. And those are the challenges that we, as you've mentioned, together with um, Professor uh, Bob Manukin from, from the Harvard Law School and with Professor Alain Nantereur mm-hmm. from, from Brandeis. I was uh, pleased to be on a panel with them recently hosted by the program on negotiation at Harvard, and the panel was entitled "The Moral Dilemmas." Right, that's what you were referencing the other, the other moment. It raises real moral dilemmas of whether we negotiate, of under what conditions do we bargain? In the in the word in the title of Professor Manukin's book is "Bargaining with the Devil." Under what conditions do we bargain with war criminals? or those who are accused of war crimes? To answer that question, one has to be, again, more of a, more of an, uh, you know, with more knowledge of, of the legal aspects. As a negotiation strategist interested in power dynamics, I am more interested in 
not so much under what conditions can we do it, but how do we do it practically if we actually do do it. Uh, and the argument that I make in the in the article, in essence, is that we have to enable as much as possible the Ukrainians to deny, continue to deny and roll back uh, Russian military efforts on the ground, deny them in the sense of preventing them from succeeding, imposing as many costs on the ground on the Russian invaders as as possible, uh, that we as a united West uh, and that really – especially the NATO alliance, especially mm -hmm. the United States, uh, but also leading countries in Europe have to be clear in their deterrent uh, posture. I think that has been uh, uh, not as effective, let me put it this way, as it could have been. Uh, and finally, continue to escalate the level of punishment, the costs we impose on the Russian uh, on the on the Russian government and the and the key officials, and that's what really the latest sanctions that came after the Buka uh, uh, revelations indicate is that the West is really tightening the screws on the Russian government. But as you impose these combined costs, the deterrence, the denial on the ground, and the the economic punishment uh, in terms of sanctions, et cetera, we have to, again, combine that, and that is the structured choice that is at the core of a coercive negotiation approach to impose massive costs on the interlocutor, on the adversary, to demonstrate that their preferred policy will not work and cannot succeed and, be and bears with it incredible costs, but also to open an alternative. And that is, again, I come back full circle, Leo, to that to that ramp off, to open the door to an alternative where they can walk out without feeling like they've been cornered and have to fight for their life or for their, for their ultimate dignity, public dignity. And that is the, the nuance, again, that is the more is revealed, as I say, about Russia's actions, the more painful personally and difficult morally it is for me to continue arguing for that and yet i think it's an argument that has to be at least heard mm. and considered how far how far are we willing to go um with coercive and nuclear negotiations if the facts point the other way around of what we want is not what we are getting and there has been sanctions uh, ever since the conflict started but it doesn't seem to work. So how, how far are we willing to go and what is the most ultimate fear there? And look, uh, Leo, you mentioned this coercive and nuclear, and nuclear um, you know, all nuclear negotiations, I would argue, are coercive. Not all coercive negotiations are nuclear. And as we look at, and you've mentioned the conflicts around the world, I mean, the, the negotiations with North Korea, for example, over their nuclear program, the negotiations with Iran over their nuclear program, those are clearly coercive negotiations where we're negotiating with, uh, as, as, as it's Haq Rabin, the Israeli uh, um, uh, Prime Minister famously said, right, you don't negotiate peace with your friends, right? You and, and it's been rephrased so many times that I'm probably butchering the expression, but you negotiate <laughs> peace with your with your enemies. And so um unfortunately the alternative to you're asking me how far we can go, the alternative to a coercive negotiation is that well there are a couple very stark ones, neither of which are, I hope your listeners will agree, are very attractive. One is, you know, just saying, well, sanctions don't work. Let's not use sanctions at all. Let's just throw our arms up into the air and say, this is a fait accompli. North Korea has nuclear weapons. We just have to live with them. The other alternative is military, some kind of a military solution, which holds with it 
very great dangers. Um, in, in, in every case, the dangers are different. And so to the debate in the scholarly literature, as you may know about the efficacy of economic sanctions when applied to various um, various situations is is very the debate is alive and well and very robust. And so, for example, there's an argument that sanctions don't work against major geopolitical actions like grabbing grabbing territory. The argument that I would make is that sanctions are essentially necessary but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. That without sanctions, without – and especially, again, there are sanctions, Leo, right? And there are um, these – the sanctions that we have now imposed that the Western world, the entire world has imposed on Russia are unprecedented – of unprecedented nature. Uh, even though, of course, not all of the banks have been taken out of SWIFT and oil and gas have not been uh, – those those things have not been cut off. But it's still uh, a remarkable intensity of, of the economic sanctions. Sanctions take the time to work. And so one month, even though in terms of human life and human suffering, it has been – uh, unbearable to watch in terms of in terms of impact in terms of economic punitive impact still very very early on um, so one could argue uh, we, we ought to to let them uh, play out but again as in everything Leo and I'll end on that what are the alternatives as you go I need to take the chance to also um, voice out a message from my friend who is also studying conflict resolution, and she says, our course is very frustrating. As an expert in the field who both teach, research, and advise, what hopeful line there is for someone willing to embrace into this field of expertise as a conflict analyst? Well, as, as I, would, I would only say, I think maybe... The, the fundamental hope that there is for uh, somebody, for a young specialist who is entering the field of negotiation, conflict resolution, mediation, which is the subject of, as you may know, of a, of a, new, of a new book, which I've had the honor of co-authoring with, with Alain Lempereur and, and several other colleagues recently, is that mediation, which is facilitation of disputes, facilitated negotiation. Negotiation, conflict resolution is so much more preferable ultimately to war. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt, who is one of my uh, great political political heroes, uh, the wife of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, obviously the, the American president and she was – Eleanor Roosevelt was a great supporter of the United Nations uh, early on from its, from its um, uh, you know, a, a founding in the mid-1940s post the Second World War. And she said, you know, this organization – I think that was the, exp- the, the, the quote – this organization will not take you to heaven, but this organization will prevent you from going to hell. And the, however modest uh, the optimism in that in that statement, I do find that I, I do find optimism and hope uh, in the otherwise highly depressing interview, possibly that I've uh, that I've offered you perspective that I offered you today. But to Not your really. but to your friend. And to others who are considering studying negotiation, I say this this field and this approach to managing differences between countries, between people, between organizations has incredible promise if we come into it with full heart, with full empathy, and with full awareness of the limitations of uh, of the approach, of the limitations of the win-win approach to negotiating, with the limitations as well of the coercive 
negotiation approach. If we really come into it with a full self-awareness of how limited sometimes, how difficult, how physically intensive. And I, and I do want to end on this, Leo, about I want to come back full circle to the idea of how we teach uh, negotiation and conflict resolution because what I ask at the beginning of the classes of the executive sessions that I teach all over the world, when I have a group of executives in the room, I come in and they're surprised when I say, what I want you to prepare to have in this class, and they're expecting me to say time and self-awareness and empathy. And Leo, I tell them, no, what I expect you to have is stamina, physical stamina, because negotiation is hard. It's physically exhausting to be negotiating. And as a mediator, especially, it is physical and emotional exertion to be there between the two, between or among the worrying parties, where you become often the subject of their ire and subject of their emotional, emotional distress. I know you have to go, and I'm happy to be working on your side. Thank you, Leo, very much for having me. Thank you.